Hello, my name is John Gregory and welcome to the Redis Conf 2021 talk using Redis Streams for real-time train movement monitoring. What are we going to be talking about today? Well, this is a case study talk and it's going to focus on how Resonate have used Redis Streams to solve a problem rather than a technical session on Redis Streams itself. We're talking a little bit about Resonate, the challenge, selection of Redis Enterprise, more detail about the project itself, some results, uh, next steps, and the key learnings and takeaways that we found as we've gone along. A little bit about me. As you can probably tell from the photo, I've been in IT for 20 plus years. I've been worked in uh, manufacturing, retail, e-commerce, and consultancy roles. And currently I work at application, uh, as an application architect for Resonate. Who are Resonate? Well, we're a UK-based company. We have offices in London, Milton Keynes and Derby. The majority of the UK is still working from home, so I'm talking to you today from Rutland, the smallest county in the UK. The company itself consists of about 175 plus people, and we're a technology company specialising in rail and connected transport solutions. We design and build traffic management, operations management and signal and control systems. Okay, so the challenge. We uh, needed to produce a real-time train movement monitoring application. And this section is split into two uh, high-level groups, really. The, some detail about the high-level requirements for the project, and then some more detail about the challenges of working in the rail domain. So some key requirements. As I said, it's a near real-time view of trains and the associated rail infrastructure over about 250 plus unique schematic maps of the rail network. As well as a live view, we also needed to uh, have a replay functionality that would replay data of up, to, um, up to 30 times speed. And that was going to be used for comparison and analysis of recent event dates, recent events. The data comes from a number of different sources. We need to process it and combine it together, performing functions like matching it to a timetable, uh, the planned route, this predicted route, and the functionality and location of the train. And of course, we need to react and notify of any changes to either trains, routes, timetable as they happen. Some of the key stats for the project. Well, there's around 25,000 trains per day in the UK. There's 2,500 concurrent users. 30 plus organisations would use the application. The data is sourced from 180 different signalling systems throughout the country, and they can send hundreds of thousands of events per hour. I've mentioned there's 250 plus uh, unique maps. Mm -hmm. A user could possibly have 16 maps open per user session, but in reality, uh, most users would have, say, three or four. Um, and the data that we collect and process, we need to archive and make sure that it's restorable into the system for a period of up to seven years. Some of the challenges <coughs> in the domain itself. Well, the UK rail network is, is very complex. It comprises many different IT systems. These IT systems have, have been introduced over many years and the data needs to be combined together to create a true picture of events. That data may not have necessarily been designed to go together, so uh, there can be quite a lot of work to, to get that true picture. The infrastructure and the trains and some of the other, other uh, functions within the railway are managed by separate organisations in the UK, so they all need to work together and, and they would all use this system in order to get that view. As I mentioned, there's some complex processing required, not only to combine the data, but to also uh, make sure that it's correct. And above all else, it's a transport system. Uh, there's people being moved on trains. The system needs to be reliable, resilient, scalable, but above all else, it needs to be safe. So why did Resonate choose Redis Enterprise uh, for its streaming solution? When we looked at the architecture, we could see straight away that it suited streaming architectures. It suited event-driven uh, processing. So we looked at the, the products that are out there on the market and Redis Enterprise was evaluated alongside other streaming and queuing platforms. One of the key factors we had really is that we had to run the application on cloud and on, on, uh, and on premise. So that ruled out a lot of the, the cloud uh, native tools. So Redis Enterprise became sort of the clear front runner um, for a number of reasons. Really, uh, Redis Enterprise is one platform and it, it solved multiple problems for us caching streams, searching, performance. 
Streams in particular, ready streams if you're not familiar, um, they're a, 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 an append-only data structure that would allow us to create an, an immutable log of events, crucially in sequence. And those streams can be read from any point, so that would really help us with the replay functionality. We would have the confidence that it hadn't been changed or moved because it was immutable, and we could essentially keep that sequence of events, uh, so that gave us the ordering. Uh, Using Redis Enterprise meant that we could manage the data retention on each of the streams. Uh, and a lot of the other streaming solutions we looked at, they, they really require a combination of different tools and different servers to work together. So it would introduce architectural complexity. And we were very conscious that we had a lot of complexity in business logic. So keeping the architecture, the implementation simple would really be a benefit to us. So how did we go about adopting Redis Enterprise? As I mentioned, we, we really made a big effort to avoid complexity. Uh, we said that Redis would be the single source of truth and that all services would communicate via Redis. All the data sharing, all the state, all the data communication would go through Redis itself and there would be no service to service communication. That meant we could have really a frictionless addition of any new services. We could scale services easily. Uh, we could drop services out, split services as, as we kind of went through the agile development process. So that was really beneficial, uh, beneficial for us. Each service manages its own Redis area for storage for any local processing that it needs to do. Uh, and, and that really allows the services to, to sort of take care of their own business as such. They can scale if they restart, they can clear out and start again. But the Redis streams themselves, because they're the bridge between services, they uh, work in two functions. They either have intermediary data or they have essentially the data that's been calculated and processes, processed and would form the uh, data that became the seven-year archive. So we manage that centrally so we can ensure that we stay on top of the, the, the intermediary streams, but we don't uh, compromise the, the long-lived streams. All the streams follow a single writer principle. Uh, they can have many readers but generally only one service will, will populate a stream. So a little bit more on how we've used Redis within the application. The tech stack, as I mentioned, Redis Enterprise, using Redis streams at its core. Uh, we've also used the Redis search module. Uh, and Redis formed the core of the application around which we've built an event-driven microservice architecture. The technology stack is Java and Spring Boot, resonates with Java House, so that was a natural choice. We've used an Angular client for the schematic maps. And in order to uh, keep the event-driven nature of the application all the way through to the client, we've used server sent events for push notifications. The maps subscribe to events. Uh, it's not bi-directional communication. So WebSockets were, were, uh, were too, a bit too heavyweight for this uh, use. And server sent events can cope with uh, dropping connection, any kind of strange proxy servers between the browser and the server, a lot better than uh, WebSock is good. So I mentioned schematic maps a number of times. This is actually what a schematic map looks like. This is the application itself when in, in a browser. Uh, this is a Paddington area, if anyone's familiar with it. The white lines, they obviously represent the track. The, uh, blocks, uh, the, the amber blocks are uh, signals, uh, sorry, um, platforms, and the four uh, alphanumeric uh, boxes are the trains themselves. The, the code represents a head code, which is how a train is um, identified. This is actually a GIF, so you should see things moving around, hopefully. Um, when the line goes thicker, that shows the predicted route of the train. And trains move in this kind of block movement because they're moving between sections of track. Only one, tra uh, only one train can occupy that section of track at one time. So it's not a linear movement as it moves through, um, but it's showing that, that that section is occupied by that train and signals uh, adjust accordingly. You should see them going red and green as the train moves. How are these screens driven then? Well, we've got two groups of data within the application. We have the live operational data, where we're very much focused on, on the real-time uh, element of it. And then we have the replay data. So the operational data, uh, we ingest data from, from the sources and then uh, do some very basic validation and then we move into the, into the Redis streams. The streams then move through the microservices so we get this kind of flow of data. And then out the other side, we have a broadcaster that manages the uh, client's subscriptions to the maps and broadcasts the events out. 
One of the challenges we had was uh, a map can be opened at any time, so we needed to be able to very quickly display the initial state. And the best way to do that was to create snapshots within Redis that are period periodically created. Uh, when a map opens, it takes a latest snapshot and then simply replays any events uh, between that snapshot time and the current time in order to get the current state. That also works very well for connection restore, connection loss, so we can uh, maintain the confidence that the data being displayed is correct. Some of the so uh, different events go through different microservice calls. The maximum we have is, is five in-sequence calls and stream operations. Uh, and we've been recording that going through Redis within 500 milliseconds, which is fantastic for us because we have to process everything within one second from receipt to the client. So the quicker it goes through Redis, the more time we have for network latency, you know, anything between the browser and the, and the server. Some of the functions that we are, are actually doing, as I mentioned before, services come in, they get matched to a, a timetable. We work out their punctuality, we work out if they're on the correct route. If they're not on the correct route, we then work out a predicted route for them. We make sure the location's where it should be. So there's quite a lot of processing going on. We also have to do things like timetable changes that occur during the day for any delays or changes in the service. One of the key elements of this is we need to uh, ensure at least once delivery for messages. So we've solved that problem by using consumer groups and the Redis pending entries list. Using the commands expend and next claim, when a service picks up or a consumer group picks up a message, an entry goes onto the pending entries list. Another service of the same type can monitor that and it checks before it picks any messages off the stream if there's any uh, messages on the pending list that have exceeded the time allocation. And if there are, then it picks those off and processes those. So that allows us, if a service uh, for some reason gets delayed or crashes, another service will come and pick those messages up and process them through within the time allocation that we have. The second group of data I've mentioned, we've got the replay data. Obviously replay isn't live anymore, it's a set of historical data held in streams and this is where streams are really useful for us because the stream data is immutable, it's held in event sequence, so we've got confidence that when, wherever we go uh, within that stream, the data is going to be as we expect it to be. For replay, we can simply navigate to a point in the stream that matches the time selected and then replay the events from that time. Obviously, we can replay at any speed we like, so we can go up to the 30 times speed which is required. We can also fast forward and rewind by simply traversing the stream. The streams don't contain all of the data that we need. It would make them too large and there's really no need for doing it. So we take that uh, stream data, which is essentially the, the events that happened, and then we uh, map to another data store, uh, which takes the infrastructure data, the infrastructure data at the time was recorded as well. We combine those together to get a true picture of the events uh, at the time of recording, which could be you know, quite a few months ago. And then we replay that to the client. I mentioned we used the Redis search module, and this was uh, for uh, uh, a unique problem where we needed to provide uh, customizable views or live customizable, customizable views of the rail, inf uh, rail, infra rail infrastructure, specifically trains, where um, the user would define those queries. So we allowed the user to define the queries in the UI, they get translated into Redis search queries, and to get the live element, we then subscribe to the streams that identify train movement events. When a train movement event comes in, it triggers the processes and services that go back to the query manager and say, do you have any queries relating to this train? If you do, the Redis search is then triggered and the updates are pushed down to the client. So that's really helped to save a lot of complex code by using that process. We're essentially building uh, on, on code that we've already written for the, for the live process and then use Redis Search to give us the customizable queries. Okay, a little bit about the results. Um, we were developing this during the, the pandemic, so that meant that the UK Railway uh, was running a severely reduced timetable, and obviously there was less trains. So we were very keen to use uh, pre-pandemic test data recordings to ensure that we would uh, be able to scale and, and, and meet all the scenarios. We created extensive automated testing to simulate all the scenarios and the results we've seen are that we can process messages from receipt through to the client within one second and we, we are getting sort of no loss or undelivered messages within the Redis domain 
which has worked out really well for us. Next steps and key learnings. Well, the next steps, we have, we have this core application where we're ingesting data, flowing it through a set of processes uh, through Redis and our broadcaster uh, process. So Redis is obviously very uh, extendable. It's easy to, to put more readers on the stream. So we can increase uh, the, the data coverage and the reach of the application. We can bring in that uh, additional data sources to en enrich the current operational view um, of, of the system. Uh, so those data sources may include weather data, maintenance schedules, depot information, etc. Trains have to be on a track somewhere. So if they're not on the track, they're usually in a depot. Knowing where trains are within a depot, if they're being maintained, uh, can really have that operational view. We can also uh, extend the operational and historical data we've got with a predictive capability and start kind of building all these data sources together. And obviously we can integrate this view into other traffic management products that exist within the rail network. Some of the key learnings and takeaways. Quite early on, we realized that uh, the data size and housekeeping strategy is important. Redis is an in-memory database. You size your servers uh, accordingly. Uh, if you run in, in the cloud, then uh, you, you, you know, you're, you're paying as you go for those. Um, you've got to make sure that you don't let your data grow too big and then you're going in and housekeeping it, especially when you've got a live feed coming in um, because they just grow and grow and grow. Um, and if you, you can give yourself a bit of a false sense of, of, of um, progress because you then suddenly have to stop and go back and start putting housekeeping in because you, you're essentially filling up your databases and filling up your servers. It can lead to, uh, to additional costs. So it's early to get that management. Uh, it's important to get that management strategy in early on. One of the key, uh, one of the useful features we found is uh, you can use streams, ready streams for the microservice configuration. We have a lot of complex configuration for this system and we wanted to make sure that each of the services you was, was using the correct configuration. So we used a ready stream. When the service starts up, it looks at the last previously uh, successfully processed message and takes its configuration from that. That way we know that every, when a service starts up, it's always got the latest copy of the configuration. If we need to update it, we simply publish to the stream and any services that are running, will just pick up that message and update their configuration. If a service scales up, reboots, fails, whatever the cause, we know that it's always going to go and get the latest version of the configuration and we're not going to get kind of an imbalance or mismatch across the system. Another point to be aware of um, is when you start developing, if you if you run everything locally, if you run Redis uh, and, your, and your services on the same machine or very close machines, you can get a sort of false sense of performance because you don't really have any network latency in there. Then when you start moving um, Redis into the cloud, you can see what appears to be a drop in performance, but it's really just the introduction of network latency. Because of speeds that are possible with Redis, uh, network latency becomes a, a lot more prominent. So it's just something to be aware of. Overall, everyone's reported uh, within the project that there's been a low barrier to adopting Redis Enterprise and Redis Streams. We've used the Redis University training a lot, and that's been really useful. And we've had Redis Labs support throughout. So they have been involved uh, helping us on board and, and, and choose Redis uh, Enterprise. They've been involved in the architecture, design and infrastructure. And we structured it in a way that we held the sprint planning day. And then the day after, we, uh, it was nine o'clock the day after, we had a regular meeting in Redis Labs to talk about the work uh, ahead for that sprint that involved Redis. And that, that really uh, enabled us to bounce ideas off them, uh, validate and just make sure that we were taking the right, correct approach which obviously saves time and saves money overall. So the penultimate slide uh, and the quote of the talk, Redis Enterprise and Redis Streams in particular allowed Resonate to reduce architectural complexity using one product for caching, streaming and database to create a scalable and evolvable near real-time application. As I said earlier, we have a lot of complex processing, so having that architectural simplicity, the ability to add and remove services easily has, has really helped us. And that's the end of the talk. Uh, thank you for listening. I hope you found it interesting. My email is on the slide deck if you have any questions or feedback. It would be great to hear from you. Thanks again. I hope you all enjoy the rest of the conference. Goodbye.